We've always been pretty balanced people who enjoy life, so we've never we've never um, chased after any kind of compensation for you know dissatisfaction in our lives through trying to be you know rock stars. Like we weren't like you know bullied endlessly in school, and we we're going to teach them. We're going to be big and famous. We've never really been those kind of people. We've just been in it for the love of the music. So success has always been the idea of not having to do another job while you make music. So just yeah, being yeah. a full-time musician has been the, the, the Get, benchmark. Getting the chase the, to be able to freely chase the moment with the, with the music. But um, we also entered into that time of, um, you know, with downloading, downloading's made music more honest now. You know, there's not some dude getting rich off a, a haircut and a, you know, one hit wonder song written by someone else. Well, I guess there is still the, the slot pop few, world, but yeah. it's, the, it's diminished from like the Motley Crue Skid Row days, you know, where like everyone was just instantly a millionaire if they reached a certain uh, amount of people knowing about them in the scene where like if you're in it, if you're in it now, you're kind of in it for the right reasons. Australia's good because um, it's, it's not like an ocean here where I'd imagine if you try and make a ripple here, it, it really would be hard to resonate through the country, whereas in Australia, because it's it's got that, you know, let's say for example you lived in a country that had a thousand people in it, if you played a gig on Friday night and you guys were awesome then the whole country would know about it overnight, whereas in America you got like 200, 300 million or something so it's just incredibly hard to start that pulse of information whereas in Australia um, if you keep at it and you just play well and you write good songs, thanks to the power of the internet you don't, you're not being filtered through you know business structures um, you can float to the top quite easily unless you're completely like ignorant and you don't do any promotion or any kind of media so um, I think the definition of success is like free free sandwich <laughs> <laughs> free water it's pretty well, man. Yeah. so what was the Australian scene like say 2005 when you guys were just oh, forming amazing oh, amazing yeah glory well, days obviously you guys have heard of carnival and cog cog um, the butterfly effect it's I guess we, we are, we've got a really developed alternative rock scene, whereas in America it seemed like about 10 years ago everything kind of divided and um, whereas like Tool and the Deftones came out and they were just so fucking amazing that for some reason people just decided they weren't going to, they, they didn't seem to grow the next wave of bands after them that had that clean singing with a big epic feel, like it kind of went really really heavy or it kind of got a bit cheesy like Nickelback and um, that middle area that, you know, because it was like Deftones and Tool kind of covered so much ground that it was kind of intimidating. I think it's business it though, like the, the site, America, like the explosions of, of new genres. It, like right now, what, it was 2011, 10 years ago, what what would music have been like 10 years ago? It was basically the same as it is now, really. Like you got those minor genres, dubstep or whatever, but like over the decades, it was just, every decade was extremely different. And I think um, the end of the 90s was maybe where big record labels and managed to really just squeeze the life out of originality and risks weren't being taken anymore. If you look at all the great bands of the past, they all just did their own thing and it was almost like a, a fluke that they got big and now it seems to be very formula based and, and that's what kind of I think made America take a little back seat a little bit as far as the cutting edge rock scene and um, it left a little room for you know Australia I think from our perspective at least to, yeah. to, to kind of create some spin-offs of a lot of American influences into stuff that was original. Yeah. When New Metal came, New Metal got really uncool really quick in Australia and um, yeah, there was no Limp Bizkit, Corn Wannabe, suddenly they all just, every band, I, I was in a band like that and every, it just, everything ceased suddenly and everyone just sort of singer started singing and... So what were those early shows like? And I'm assuming those early shows were with bands like The Butterfly Effect. It kind of all actually gave us our first, um, oh. our first proper tour. Yeah, it was so, um, great. We wouldn't have thrown in the deep end though, because we spent like uh, was it like 18 months writing and refining our sound, and we did an EP basically as we started playing, and so um, and it was quite a you know quite a well formed sounding EP. So the big bands kind of grabbed us straight away, and we we're, were touring before our 20th show, I think. Yeah, we 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 jumped in early into the live scene, and um, yeah, we thrust in front of like a thousand people. Yeah. Just yeah. all of a sudden, you're in front of a thousand. Yeah, people. yeah. Most yeah. bands, they they kind of go, just got to get out there. Don't worry about the songs. Get out there. We were the opposite. We just went, we got to get the songs sounding to a point where we mm. love them, and we thought it was, you know, world class. And then we started playing shows. So. Yeah, so we did the Ugly Betty stage where you have like you know two good songs and you go and play in front of your mates and eight of the ten songs in your set you're probably going to be ashamed of in a couple of years to come. And we did that in private in our own rehearsal room. 
what we what we learned from that was the power of writing good songs. So we because we were relentless in our quest for every song being a song that we were passionate about. Even when we kind of sucked a bit live at the start, people were just still extremely passionate because of the songs. Whereas you flip it around, you take a band with really average songs and an incredible tight performance, it doesn't draw people in the same way. So it just showed us that we were on the right path as, as far as um, you just got to try and create meaningful music that yeah, translates to people and then the live show is secondary. And when you get both combined, obviously that's when you get an amazing experience. Are there particular stories or fond memories from that first carnival tour? <laughs> None that we can a, talk there was, about. There was a lot of vodka. <laughs> we, we, we used to get quite nervous when we started playing and stuff, so we did that typical, you know, tried to find an extrovert. Get drunk a lot, yeah, yeah back get, then, so. Well, how long did it take for the band to escalate? You said that things moved pretty fast over in Australia. Yeah. I mean, and the album debuted at number two on the charts. Yeah, yeah, that was a blowout. Um, well, our, our release before that was a, um, an EP of five, six songs? Six songs? Yeah, and um, we're, we're lucky enough to, uh, one of those songs resonated with the people at the Triple J Radio in Australia, which is a, a, like a youth station that most people listen to. It's a not-for-profit organisation in Australia that's has a, yeah, it's a station yeah. that appears everywhere around the country. So it's not like all Snoop Dogg, all that, you know, what's another, Little Wayne, all that kind of vibe. It's more, um, it's cool alternative stuff and, and most of the people of our demographic would listen to that station in Australia and they picked us up and um, really, we just went, suddenly there was hundreds of people coming to the shows and we were singing along and it was kind of yeah. freaky. It's good. What about the Judas Priest show? I heard there were a couple guys in the crowd yeah, that questioning our pleased. sexuality. Yeah, well, they're not questioning mine, really. Yeah, um, <laughs> but you know, ironically, Rob Halford is probably smoked a lot of pole this time. But us being <laughs> raging the I couldn't figure out if it was a compliment or not. But there was some dude with a bad mullet that looked like an ugly girl, and another dude just was, in stereo <laughs> calling us. Yeah, it was um, because we live in Brisbane in Australia, and the show was at the Brisbane Entertainment Centre, which is where we've gone and seen like. Chili Peppers and Tool and Bell Jam. Bell Jam and all that stuff. So, so the and, biggest venue in town. And it coincidentally was the night before our tour. So we went, yep, let's do it. And um, it, was it, it was good fun. Like, we, we rose to the challenge. We'd never actually ever been heckled before, so it was our first um, was first heckling. It felt pretty sweet. Interesting. Mm. Um, you mentioned new metal and how new metal became uncool and how. Uh, one sector of people ended up going really heavy and one went to the alternative. So the super heavy crowd, was that, is that band's like, I killed the prom queen? Oh no, I was talking about, um, that was my analogy of, um, say, America. Uh, it felt like, you know, like the hardcore music came out, you know, like full fight dancing, that kind of style, and that really dominated. Then there, there was that stained Nickelback, what's that other horrible band? The dude that sounds like Eddie Vedder? I don't know. Three Doors Down. Three Doors Down. No, yeah. um... See there? Yeah, there's, there's a few, yeah. yeah. Anyway, like the... A butt lot rock of, bands. A lot of that kind of stuff happened. Whatever you call that, is it called, like cock rock or something here? Or? Butt rock. Butt rock, yeah. Butt rock, yeah. And by then it just didn't feel like there was a lot of... There was probably Chevelle, Circus Survive, and um, the Mars Volta were the only bands that really popped on our radar that seemed to have gone in that middle ground, you know, where, where Tool and Deftones, you know, when, when Anima was out and Lateralis and it was just the biggest shit in the world. It's fucking amazing. I think in Australia, when the, the new metal scene kind of faded and uh, chunky riffs kind of weren't enough to bring the crowds, bands either, either went heavy or they went like pop, or they just, in our case, we just tried to make great songs and we pulled elements from styles that we liked and, and then tried to have our own spin on it and it just became about, yeah, about and songs. All, and all the bands in the scene, so there was us kind of all, oh, so it was, I guess it was COG. Uh, the Butterfly Effect, then Carnival, then Us, and then there's yeah, a bunch of other bands as well floating around and we just developed a scene and everyone was playing with each other and um, so yeah, great push, pushing, pushing each other, all the singers were like, you know, stretching higher and higher with the bigger notes and it was, it was, it was exciting. I guess yeah. the whole thing is not relying on a subculture, when you've got a subculture of new metal fans or hardcore fans or emo fans, then it's very easy for a little while, but we have yeah, no subculture, it's just people that like music and it's very much reminiscent of uh, what I think is like the early 90s. Like you could be a massive band like, you know, Soundgarden for example, 
and you could appeal to people that uh, you know have ex extremely fine musical taste or you know total mainstream people it didn't matter as long as the songs were good and and yeah we tried we like to think that that's that's what we're doing just trying to write good songs and, and we're and speaking on the, the australian scene not just us here like there's, there's if you dive if you dive into the you know that that world of carnival and cog and butterfly effect there's, there's some pretty amazing songwriting going on there on the topic of great songs what is it that makes a great song in terms of characteristics it's the goosebumps for me when you just kind of go whoa like you feel that wave of, of something just just making you buzz then that's it and that's just an honesty I reckon with lyrics like when you know people like Maynard and Chino and these guys it, it just feels really real it doesn't feel like a bunch of cliches put together you know especially for singers that's my opinion like if it, when it's really real and heartfelt and you can you can dive into it and that, that's that's the real stuff so what's it like going from massive shows in Australia and coming here and virtually starting from the ground up it's awesome it's it's awesome those are like just uh, I guess the only layer that we suffered on a little bit was the fact that, you know, we've got crew in Australia that help us set everything up and do that kind of stuff. And we're quite, we're not the most organised people on that level of, you know, the small things like that. But uh, it's really, really good. It's amazing being the underdogs, you know, coming out and having no one know who you are and the objective of walking on the stage is to walk off with everyone's hand in the air. Um, it was incredible that with Animals as Leaders coming out and doing that and being such a different genre as well, like just seeing all those you know, quite metal crowds, like, we'd, we'd play the first song and they'd be like... Where's the hoops? And then, um, yeah, by the end they were all loving it and um, heaps of the same people who have been at the show so far. That were yeah, we, we got no tour. problems playing to five people. It's, yeah. We, we, we're lucky we know some great bands in Australia that have, you know, we've, we've taken on some of their wisdom and they talk about, you know, coming to... It doesn't matter where you go, like, if you're playing to five people or 5,000 people, just give it everything because, you know, like, even on a... Mm. Even in a rational business sense, you don't you don't know who those five people are, and um, it's just the whole starting the the wave as well. It's, like, it's actually one of the most exciting um, stages of your career, is when you um, you start out and no one knows who you are. You know, there's there's pressures associated with having you know two thousand people there paying thirty bucks to see you play as well, mm -hmm. and knowing every word of every song. Like it's it's kind of that full fresh start. Like our, it's it's got like being transported back in time to do it again over here but we're a lot better at good. instruments now than we were it's then. Just, it just adds diversity to our experience. Yeah. When there's heaps of people then it's after a little while it, you know it's great to go back to it's like when you go on tour and then you go home and you write and you go to the studio and then after you get sick of the studio you go on tour and mm. just diversity is good. I'm not saying that we want you know we want to stay at this level forever <laughs> in America. We'd, we'd like more people to come eventually but um, yeah it's good fun man it's really good fun. Americans are really nice.